this one's going to be fun. We get to talk about Nintendo again. Uh, but it's a, it's an article that was sent to me that is about apparently the Internet's war on Nintendo. Um, so I'm going to have a really fun perspective here as somebody who's a fan of Nintendo stuff specifically. Most consoles I've owned have been Nintendo. Uh, most everything that I play usually is either PC or Nintendo. I honestly can't wait. One is from Technic Druid. This is my first fan art. Just a basic Cirrus hammer made in Blender. I hope you like it. I like it. I do. I like the chain. I like that the chain has been like the chain attached to the hammer. Ever since the hammer moved from my hand to my character's tail, uh, the chain has been incorporated more often uh, in in hammer stuff. I kind of want to imagine like a fighting style with that hammer, almost God of War esque, where as like. Sometimes the hammer is swung like a hammer and other times like the character throws the hammer and like uses the chain for leverage and swings it around that way like Kratos. That'd be fun. Uh, what's community day? Uh, Blendjet. Community day or Bienjet. Community day means when we're done with topics. So right after this video, uh, we're all going to be playing commander together. Uh, there's going to be open invites for spell table and we'll all be getting into voice comms and playing card games for the rest of the night. The next one we have here is from Shady Shion. Made another version of the cat hoodie model after seeing the Anka Dance Cirrus during the stream a while ago. If you know, you know. If you know, you know. I like the braided hair there. Like the long hair with the one braid. I like it. I really do. You know, there's nothing suggestive in this picture. She's dancing. The cat is dancing, everyone. The cat is dancing. Rublum, she was dancing. She was definitely dancing. The last one we have here is from Sword Sappho. Here we have a Hero Forge mini based on OG Cirrus. Yeah. With big, big hammer. As always, everyone, thank you all for your fan art submissions. If you want your fan art to be shown in a future video, best way to do so is to drop into the fan art section of the Discord. With that said, if you haven't subscribed or hit the bell notification icon or even checked out the Patreon, maybe consider doing so, as those things help out the channel more than I can really relay on a single stream. With that said, let's get right into this particular article. It's on Minds, and it's from someone named the Detroit Otaku. It begins with a quote from a dose of Buckley, who we've covered before. Uh, Nintendo has become the internet's favorite punching bag. Oh boy. I can't wait to see where this goes. Dancing. Yes, dancing. Not super worried about the quote itself. Uh, but Nintendo may have revived the video game industry and continues to make new and innovative games but they are quickly falling victim to the cult of historical revisionism. The company that revived gaming has become controversial because the idea of Nintendo has become controversial. This is all thanks to the talk successful called the internet. Wow, what? Oh my God, look at the investigative journalism. The internet, everyone. The internet. That was what it was. That's all. That's what changed everything. The, the internet. Not a specific site on the internet. Not specific communities. No, no, no. Just the internet existing. Evil. Terrible internet. There are counter historical claims being for put forth by PC gamer. Oh no! It's console war shit. <laughs> it's just console war shit again. There are counter historical claims being put forth that there was no video game crash and that the games industry needed no saving. And there are mobs of Sony and PC fanboys and trolls who compare Nintendo to EA, a company who was named worst company in America two consecutive years. Oh boy, fun history lesson. Let's go ahead and talk about the 
video game crash that happened thanks to Atari. Basically, video games of varying, usually low quality, flooding the market, making it to where consumer trust in the video game industry basically all went out the window. So when Nintendo came to America and gave us their first console here, instead of looking like the Famicom in Japan, which was a top loader console with attached uh, controllers, we got the Nintendo Entertainment System, which looked more like a VCR. It was something to make it look more like a standard electronic or even a toy, because that would be something that would be more marketable here in the States, where video games had, for a brief time, been given a bit of a bad name. Said I literally just did a video on how E.T. Uh, helped the crash happen. Yep. E.T. and like E.T. is the one that people usually point to, but it was a variety of games. Basically, it was consumer trust in the market that was video games going downhill. Because video games were a new medium. They weren't an established thing, and they had very much lost their footing. They needed to have something establishing them as a brand, like as a concept that people could get behind again. So E.T. is one of the last straws. Europe. As an additional background, I also recommend Zero Punctuation's video on the market crash. There's a lot. Gilly the Kid did a video on it. Uh, Zero Punctuation did, vid uh, did a video on it. Um, there's a there's a bunch of different outlets you can get information on the video game crash uh, that people there. And, and what people may not realize about the video game crash, it wasn't an entirely an entirely encompassing thing. It just meant that video games as they existed in the mainstream, the hyperfixation on them, the fervor to which we approached video games, that largely died with that crash. There were still people who bought things like the Commodore 64 um, and other versions of the Atari. There are still people who were still buying video games and video game consoles, but not enough. There weren't enough people doing so compared to what was happening in years prior, which led to that crash. People still buying stocks in something doesn't matter if the majority of people are no longer buying. Did it also hit consoles harder than computers? Yep. Which is why Nintendo had to have such a strategy when they came to the United States. I, I throw that out there so that as we go through this article... People have context for the video game crash because I'm sure there's people who are watching my content who actually didn't know that there was such thing as a video game crash that Nintendo was actually very instrumental in reversing here. Consumer, uh, what was it? Consumer faith. That's the one. Consumer confidence in the video games industry increased when Super Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt became household names alongside games that were previously re uh, relegated to arcades like Pac-Man. But let's go ahead and continue. The shift from celebrating Nintendo's efforts to save... Uh, console gaming to one-sidedly framing it as an act of corporate greed by focusing on Nintendo's treatment of third-party publishers and Yamauchi era Nintendo business practices rather than the context behind Nintendo's actions as well as their many innovations and creations is an example of historical revisionism designed to hack away at the origins of Nintendo's history at the origins of console gaming. All right, let me contextualize this one as well. So, the Nintendo seal of approval... Uh, and the proprietary nature of the cartridges that they made was one of the things that was instrumental to the uh, to these uh, original Nintendo's success. You knew, usually, when you were buying a Nintendo game, you were getting something that was of a higher quality than what you would expect on the Atari. Because on the Atari, you could get anything. Like, any garbage could be shoveled onto there. Do you remember all the garbage that was shoveled onto the Wii later on? Boy, how history repeats itself. The Nintendo seal of approval also came with a bunch of very restrictive licensing and technical limitations that developers had to adhere to. And this is something that hasn't actually gone away. Nintendo's been doing this for years. Think about the technical limitations Nintendo imposed on people during the N64 era. It's a reason why many RPG uh, companies jumped ship from Nintendo and went to the Sony PlayStation. These restrictive tendencies are just part and parcel for Nintendo. Um, the Nintendo D uh, 3DS was another example of this. There was, what, a 2 gigabyte limit? 
on how large a game could be on the 3DS, despite the 3DS being able to handle game cartridges that were much larger than that because the amount of data on the cart was largely irrelevant. It was the amount of data that was currently being processed in the RAM of the system that mattered more than anything. So larger games and larger experiences either had to be entirely compressed or not present on that console at all. There were some innovations that came as a result of this that were really interesting, like the technical innovations that were in uh, Resident Evil 2. Resident Evil 2 was a multi-disc game on the PlayStation 1, and yet somehow was able to be crammed into a 64 megabyte cartridge for the N64. It was a compression journey that largely was deemed almost impossible, but by changing the way that images were compressed on the on the game itself, by changing the way that the audio was read, by changing the format for the midis, uh, by changing different cutscenes in the game to only use audio from other characters so that they could lower the amount of audio present in the game entirely, the game was able to fit on that cart. It was a technical wonder. Stuff like that is some of the good stuff that came out of Nintendo's limitations. But at the same time, we need to talk about the other side of this. Monopolies in the gaming industry, or monopolies in any industry, are not good. And Nintendo, by and large, had a monopoly on the gaming industry during the NES era. Did it mean that we got a lot of classic games and a lot of content that was great? Yes. But was it also a really restrictive time to try to be a games publisher or developer? Also, yes. This is one of the reasons why them having competition that scared them shitless for a while in the Sega Genesis was so helpful and so good. It helped break that monopoly down. And now, of course, we've got three major home consoles as opposed to just one or even two. These are all good things. LJN was a thing as well, but LJN at least made uh, Maximum Carnage. And I'm going to be honest, Maximum Carnage is a good fucking game. Anybody who argues against that uh, is wrong and bad and dumb. And I will gladly fight the entirety of the Sunset City cast if it means defending that game. Okay? Okay. That said, it can be, looking at this article here, it can be both Nintendo's greed as a business and maltreatment of third-party publishers that can exist at the exact same time as the historical significance of... Nintendo's practices of that era. This feels like trying to defend Nintendo from one side, from another group arguing from the other side, as opposed to realizing that Nintendo as a company both saved the video games industry, especially in historical significance in America, but also in America. They were incredibly restrictive for third-party publishers. They were an incredibly greedy, monopolizing company. Like, they, they were both of those things and also savior like they all of those things can be wrapped up at once now it says here the attacks on nintendo have less to do with pushing for accountability and fair competition in gaming and more to do with the agenda of the gaming press and that of nintendo's biggest competitor sony so random dipshits on the internet saying that Nintendo was a really restrictive company back then and you not liking that is part of a, a major ag agenda uh, that is being piloted by Sony? Really? that That's what you think? Don't get me wrong. Video game propaganda is not new. Does anybody remember Blast Processing for the Sega Genesis? Something that actually turned out to be kind of sort of true. Only a, not in the way that the advertisement said, but in the sense that Genesis was weaker in almost everything but processor than the uh, than the SNES. Yeah, the Genesis had a faster CPU. Like, blast processing was propaganda. It was a marketing scheme. But the Genesis just happened to also have a faster processor. So it was one part marketing scheme, one part truth. But that's all that is. To... Attacks from... Ran this is why I wish that, like, a source would be cited here. Like, where do you think that this... Like, these people are coming from? Where do you think... Personally, that these attacks are coming from? Can you give an example of that? 
I'm I'm looking through here and I don't see any examples given. So I'm just going to go ahead and say this is very source. Trust me, bro. It then says Nintendo's large fan base as well as a community of legacy gamers from the 80s and 90s are the only bulwark against the anti-Nintendo mob succeeding in their goal of destroying Nintendo. And that has made the gaming press wary of deliberately handing out low review scores on Nintendo platforms and tossing Nintendo's legacy completely overboard. What kind of video game fantasy are you living in? Okay. No, hold on. I'm gonna find. Where is it? Where is it? There we go. Here it is. I'm gonna be very disparaging for a minute. I'm gonna be very disparaging for a minute. And just... I'm going to give my impression. I'm going to give my impression of this of this guy. Leave the million dollar company alone. Back away from the million dollar corporation. The classical Reddit mod. I just... Nintendo does not need your defending. I'm sorry, they don't. They're a big company with big lawyers. They'll be fine, trust me. However, while Nintendo may have saved gaming from its demise, historical revisionists in the gaming community are attempting to erase Yamauchi from gaming history, only to replace him with a note that says, I'm sorry my company ever entered the gaming industry. If Sony ponies and PC fanboys haven't compared Yamauchi to Bernie Madoff or Dennis Kozlo uh, Kozlowski yet, it's only a matter of time until they do so. This is the equivalent of make up a guy. If, if Sony and PC fanboys haven't done this yet, don't worry, they will eventually. <laughs> If you can't find a reason to be mad at somebody, just make up a reason to be mad at them in the future. Sundarial1, thank you for redeeming your points for an... Uh, 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 fucking DGen. Also, thank you very much for redeeming your points for an owl. If Yamauchi and Iwata are to be banished from the history books in favor of crony thugs like Hisashi Suzuki and Masaaya Nakamura... So, we should probably go ahead and talk about Nakamura real quick. We need to talk about Nakamura real quick. Nakamura, if is me if memory serves, was one of the ones who was uh, stated to be one of the minds behind the Mega Man series, and then of course he went on to go create um, Mighty Number no. Nine, which was one of the most well-known uh, fucked-up Kickstarter fiascos with a shit ton of drama over it. So I'm gonna punch myself in the face for a while. Yep. Yeah, Mighty Blunder 9. So, like, when he says crony thugs, corporate hacks, or people like this, sure, I'm willing to agree with that. But let's go ahead and continue the article itself. Uh, if Yamauchi and Iwata are to be banished, and if Miyamoto and Awanuma are to be stricken in favor of talentless hacks like Randy Pitchford... No, Kiji Inafune. Inafune is, uh... Inafune was Mighty Number no. 9, not Nakamura. Right? Let me, let me, let me do some quick uh, remembering real quick. Yeah, Inafune is Mighty Number no. 9. Nakamura. I need to remember what Nakamura was responsible for. What was Nakamura responsible for? Uh, he was the founder of Namco. He, he, he was the founder of Namco. So, so Pac-Man and Klonoa. Okay. Sure. I don't know why I, I, I got him mixed up. Apologies about that. Apologies about that. Uh, Suzuki was a producer for Sega and Square. Uh, Miyamoto, for those who don't know, 
uh, Miyamoto was the person responsible for uh, Mario Brothers and a lot of the stuff where Zelda was concerned. And Aonuma is also one of the brainchild behind the Zelda series as we understand it today. Said, who's erasing Iwata? Uh, good question. I don't know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, this is very source, trust me, bro. This is very source, trust me, bro. <sighs> Yamauchi's crime is that he enabled growth and prosperity of the gaming industry. If Nintendo's claims for wanting to revive gaming are illegitimate, then the claims of third-party publishers wanting to flee Nintendo for greener pastures are also illegitimate. What? No? That's not how that works. Again, it can be... It can be simultaneous. It can be simultaneously true that Nintendo was a company that saved the video game industry and also a greedy company that uh, severely restricted what their third-party pub uh, publishers could do. It could be both of those things. Like, Nintendo could have easily, as a company, not wanted to revive the gaming industry here because of any benevolence there. And I think worshipping them as a company that did it out of the benevolence of their own hearts and the love and passion for the craft and hobby is kind of dumb. They're, they're a company. Their job is to make money. If there wasn't money in the gaming industry, they wouldn't be trying to make the money there. Worshipping the company uh, because they just happen to save the gaming industry largely feels kind of dumb. It can, in fact, be true. Nintendo is the good and the bad, and third-party publishers fleeing them because of their overly restrictive policies is also good. Like how fanboys claim that Nintendo acted too strict towards third parties and didn't allow them to develop for other platforms, yet ignore the fact that in October 99... Or 1990, Nintendo allowed third parties to develop games for other platform without exclusivity clause, and they also allowed them to manufacture their own carts. Or in October 1990. So, it can at one point be true that Nintendo did not allow third party developers to develop for other platforms during the NES era, whilst also being true that during the Super Nintendo era, Nintendo was willing to allow them to develop for third parties later. Yeah, this whole article is streaming toxic fanboyism. Hold on a second. Let me see here. Ba 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 ba. Nintendo president uh, in the Nintendo president Yamauchi said in 1986, Atari collapsed because they gave too much freedom to third party developers and markets uh, were swamped with rubbish games. By requiring the president uh, the present of the 10 NES in a game cartridge, Nintendo prevented third party developers from producing games without Nintendo's knowledge. Okay, so... Said MTG is based as fuck. Biden fads, uh, fans are mad and triggered. Okay. Sure. Are you just here to, like, praise Marjorie Taylor Greene? Are we looking at an article about a stupid Nintendo fanboy and now we've got to deal with you? Okay. I understand if you want to bring little dick energy into my stream, but that's not my... It's not my job to deal with that. You have in your title? Yeah, Magic the Gathering. We're not here to talk about Marjorie Dipshit Green. Shalmanese, thank you for the follow. It's Community Day. We're talking about Magic the Gathering today. After we're done with this Nintendo article. Curto Stampede, how you doing? Yeah, sorry, this is a Wendy's. Wrong corner of the internet. Oh no, Rafflemau, don't worry. You're also on the right corner of the internet to talk about Marjorie Taylor Greene. We, we talk about that shit here too. It just so happens we also talk about Magic the Gathering. We're here for both of those things. You're on the right corner of the internet for both of those. Marjorie represents my district in Georgia. I have opinions. But anyway, what would be her mana cost? Uh, it would be zero because she only knows how to cheat herself out. 
We also know apparently she plays Urza, which makes her not a person. But, anyways. Anyways. Let's go ahead and continue on with this, like... If Nintendo was restrictive, then why were they not restrictive? At one point, they were more restrictive, and then the restrictions le uh, later eased up as the company found success here in the States. All I know about Magic the Gathering is that Warhammer 40k had a release recently with MTG. Uh, that release is in October. We'll be getting that release soon. Like how... Uh, da -da 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 -da, we already read that. Like how they claim Nintendo is censorious because of how they censored their own first-party output, like Xenoblade Chronicles X, Fire Emblem Fates, and Tokyo Mirage Sessions, yet they ignore the fact that Nintendo doesn't censor third-party games and haven't done so since 1994. But Nintendo... Wait, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. That one sounds incorrect. Oh, it's another Minds article. Nintendo is for kids is a myth, the inconvenient truth nobody wants to hear. I feel like I want to agree with you. Jesus fucking Christ, but it's... Uh. Rolf Amel says, uh, one of a fun fact about Magic Gathering, it's seen as the first pay-to-win slash uh, free-to-play game and is used as a basis for multiple mobile titles like Raid Shadow Legends who function on similar principle. Well, yeah, that's just trading card games in general. That's just how trading card games are. There's a large pay-to-win aspect to them. It's one of the reasons we play Commander over here where, like, you can build a deck for about $30 or $40 and compete with people who have $300 decks. Nintendo actually censored a decent bit of third-party games back in the Wii era, if memory serves. But they've had plenty of consoles since then that they have not censored third-party games on. Like, this feels like somebody who is stuck in the past. Like, so severely stuck in the past about old console war rhetoric. Like, that's... <sighs> if I was still 15, maybe I would care about this. Like, Nintendo doesn't censor games that much anymore. Okay, cool. Big whoop. Who is saying Nintendo still censors games? Who, who is who is doing that? Nintendo sucks because it's for babies, though. Alt fact, I will ban you for being wrong. They claim that consoles like the GameCube are hard to work with because of its disc size. Yet they ignore the fact that most third-party games of the 6th gen were small enough to fit on a single GameCube disc and had power PC architecture that was the easiest to develop for. They claim that Nintendo was for kids, yet saved Bayonetta 2 from an ultimate demise. <sighs> this just feels like... Again, this feels like the, the fucking console war conversations that I had when I was 15 years old. Mul and and multi-disc games were a thing on, on the GameCube. Let's see here. Why were more uh, fewer third-party games on GameCube? They claim X and want uh, Y. Axo, no! Let's see here. Yeah, so apparently... Zozo, thank you so much for the resubscription. So... Let's go ahead and see here why Nintendo actually had less third-party games. Let's go ahead and do that. So there's a developer excerpt that says that Microsoft paid publishers to keep games off the GameCube, but if games went to PS2, uh, the let's see, that doesn't feel it. That doesn't feel correct. Let's see here. I'm finding, like, old NeoGAF forum conversations about this. Nothing, like, substantial. Jesus. Words are hard to put together, okay? Huh, let's see here. 
I'm not seeing anything concrete. The running theories are either that Nintendo wanted a higher share of royalties from their third-party games, and that Nintendo itself did have... Uh, there was a harder restriction for the games because there were smaller discs available. Also, the fact that the Nintendo GameCube itself was not a system that was selling very well. Like, it was the worst-selling system of its generation. The Xbox uh, sold more than the GameCube. The PlayStation sold more, uh, sold more than the GameCube. And unlike the GameCube, the Xbox had a known infrastructure for online games, which meant that there were a lot more... Uh, games of that generation being made for it after a while. The PlayStation 2 had the largest library of games. Um, but, again, a lot of that seems down. Uh, seems that the PlayStation 2 had the most sales, therefore, more games were being developed for it. Like, this is another one of those all these things can be true and still not mean a whole lot type of deal. No, the GameCube wasn't the weakest console of its gen. The PlayStation 2 was the weakest console of its generation, if you don't count, like, the Dreamcast. Like, the PlayStation 2 was weaker than the GameCube, but the GameCube sold the worst. Out of all those consoles, the GameCube sold worse than every other one. They said it's easier to hack at a company's history by star starting with the lower branches. Yamauchi is an easier target than Nintendo itself, though Sony and PC fanboys consider both to be greedy corporate ol oligarchs. They're all greedy corporate oligarchs. I'm sorry. Sony's a greedy corporate oligarch. Um, Valve is greedy corporate oligarch. They all are. Who the fuck cares? The current fights to defend Nintendo against the disinformation of the gaming press and the rabid ad hominem attacks of the anti-Nintendo fanboys are a precursor to the battles that will soon be fought to, to save gaming. Oh my God. The grandiose nature of this narrative, the grandiosness of this narrative, the feeling that this matters so much. One day, Nintendo may not be in the gaming industry anymore, and there will be days where the fanboys of the gaming industries just make remembrance articles and YouTube videos honoring the oppressed third parties that suffered under Nintendo, as well as ones trashing Nintendo's industry practices, and finally videos and articles about how Nintendo did not save gaming, and that PC gaming was the true savior of the industry. These articles and videos ha already exist, they just haven't gone mainstream yet. So wait, did this dude literally find... Homestar Runner, thank you so much for the follow. I miss Homestar Runner. Like, the, the fuck? This dude thinks Nintendo's gonna die one day and there's gonna be a whole misinformation campaign against them going forward. The <laughs> yeah, Axel's right. Nintendo's not gonna fuck you. I'm sorry. Fucking hell. These are these opinions already exist. They just aren't mainstream yet. I, I don't think they're going to be mainstream. The fuck? <laughs> this is like create a villain and make him important when he's not. We celebrate Nintendo's accomplishments as well as the legacies of Miyamoto, Iwata, and Yamauchi because it is gaming history, and because history is written by the victors. Had Nintendo not tried to go into console gaming, or if Atari or some other company tried their hand at gaming again, the fate of the video game industry would have been far uglier. Actually, you don't know that. <clears throat> Raindog TV, thank you so much for the... Uh, 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 fucking D-Gen. History is written by the victors. This is true, but saying that... The video game industry would have been much worse. You you don't know that. You have no way of knowing that. This type of, like, fetishization of alternate history stuff only works if you have some hardcore data to back it up. The gaming industry, as we know it, exists largely because of the influences of Nintendo, but the gaming industry that it would exist in that hypothetical world wouldn't be better or worse. It would just be different. We don't know if it would be better or worse because we can't measure that. 
To Nintendo fans, Nintendo went with carts for the N64 because of concerns over piracy and reliability issues with early CD consoles. To the Sony fans who are on the side of a company that historically has been far more ruthless than Nintendo or Sega ever was, third parties came to the PS1 because of the CD format, which allowed them to make bigger games. Neither side is entirely wrong, but deciding which historical perspective to go by is the difference between it being a Nintendo fan or a Sony fan. Okay, so we got thought terminating cliches. How about, once again, all of these are correct. The uh, Nintendo's format for games it was creating at the time was incredibly restrictive. So when the RPG boom began in the PlayStation 1 era, they largely weren't created for the N64 because, well, it just couldn't fit those kind of games. And cartridges were a lot more expensive to develop for than discs were, which meant that a lot of those games just didn't make it to the N64. The N64 has a very tiny library compared to what the PlayStation 1 had. And I prefer the N64. A company's leaders, founders, innovations, creations, and icons are its soul. No, it doesn't. Companies don't have souls. To replace them with another group's vision of its history is to kill that soul. That is the ultimate goal of the historical revisionist agenda. To destroy Nintendo. To stick Hiroshi Yamauchi, Satoru Iwata, uh, Eji Awanuma, uh, Gunpei Yokoi, Howard Lincoln, Reggie fils uh, Yoshio Sakamoto, and the rest of Nintendo's icons in some back room somewhere. And replace them with better and more forward-thinking heroes. Move over Yamauchi. Uh, Masaya Nakamura needs this spot. Uh, move over Sakamoto. David Jaff needs this spot. No more Nintendo Legends allowed. Who the fuck is saying that we can't celebrate the accomplishments of fucking Awanuma? Who? Whomst? Who is doing this? Show me on the console where a Sony fanboy hurt you. Please. This is how it begins. That is how it ends. Followed by the course of No More Nintendo. Businesses are not destroyed by failing consoles or financial catastrophes. A financial can recover from and move on from that. They go under when they lose any meaning to stay in operate. What? So a, so a business does not fail based on failing to meet its target sales and losing money? Actual material things that cause businesses to fail? They go under when they lose any meaning to stay in operation? Bitch, most industry businesses don't have meaning to stay in operation over and above the dollar. When they feel there's nothing they can uh, do to get back on their feet again. This is why Sega dropped out of the console business. No, I'm pretty sure Sega dropped out of the console business because of a failing console and financial catastrophe. That It had nothing to do with the spirit of the company. It had everything to do with... You know, money. It, they were not making enough money, so they changed to a software publisher exclusively. I, this grandiose narrative is dumb. It's hilarious, and it's dumb. Once the savior of the gaming industry, Nintendo has today been dubbed controversial by some gamers and journalists and developers that grew up with their products. And if Nintendo is controversial, how can the gamers and journalists and developers who say they got into gaming because of Nintendo not be just as controversial as they are? Simple. Let's take a series that is very controversial, Harry Potter, because the creator of Harry Potter is a massive piece of flaming garbage shitballs. Guess what? I am a fan of Harry Potter, and I don't think it's problematic to be a fan of Harry Potter. Do you like that world? Do you like those stories? Do you like those books? Cool. Doesn't mean you need to like the developer. Doesn't mean you need to like any publishing companies. Doesn't mean you need to like any of that shit. You just need to like the story. That's it. Same thing with Nintendo. Nintendo can be a very controversial uh, company, and being a Nintendo fan not be controversial. Minecraft can be made by a literal modern-day neo-Nazi. And it still not be problematic to like Minecraft. Sorry, that, I just had to make a notch joke. Anyway, point is, doesn't matter. The, all of this shit doesn't matter. 
Perhaps it won't be that long until IGN and GameStop put out articles with the headlines reading, Nintendo plans controversial 40th anniversary <laughs> celebration of the NES. Wait, is uh, Notch is a neo-Nazi? And you didn't know that? Dude, Notch got outed a long time ago as a flame bag piece of shit. Let's see here. I wouldn't have realized there was such a controversy without reading this. Yeah, neither would I. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. Okay. Okay. <sighs> Anyways. This article is actually the kind of thing that would make me less likely to buy Nintendo stuff. Imagine that. Nintendo fanboys making you less likely to buy Nintendo things. Weird how that works. Weird how that works. As a Nintendo fanboy who absolutely loves every Nintendo console I have ever owned, I, the Wii U was a console that I truly loved. But, you know, he's fine. I'm just going to be one person on the internet reading your weird fanficy article. I'm going to have to read more from this guy. This is... This is grade A comedy. Anyways, everybody, let me know what you think in the comment section below. Should I do more videos like this that they're not going to garner as many views, but they're, you know, more fun. They're more fun to do. As always, everyone, incident video tagline here. <laughs>